went to Cliffside. Uh-huh. And, and then I went for several subsequent years uh, to take care of his classes, and I ended up as one of his teaching assistants. Oh, that's which interesting. Was a lot, which was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the first place I ever really saw Danish technology was uh, in Eric's collections, and I knew he was working on it. And, uh, you know, that was really my first exposure to uh, Francois Boards and Jock Pellegrin and Peter Kelterborn and Bo Madsen and all the international types that Eric ran with. Uh-huh. So those were uh, those were those were awesome years for me. I mean, I spent hours and hours and hours going over Eric's collections and his library, and you know, in exchange for being a teaching assistant for Eric, I, I, he ended up working with me privately for several days after each session. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, it was just uh, that was a great period in my life. But I'm I'm from a little hick. Uh, Hick farming town in West Michigan called Greenville, and you know, I got interested in flint napping originally. Uh, we have a little nat- a little natural history local history museum in Greenville, and my mom would take me to the talks and to the museum, and I was always fascinated with arrowheads and kind of the Native American history of Michigan. And then when I was about ten years old, she took me to a talk. A guy came and he chipped a arrow point out of the bottom of a bottle with a with a copper nail. And, you know, I wanted to hunt arrowheads, and I saw this and thought, well, heck, I could I could make all the arrowheads I would ever want. I don't even have to find them. Uh-huh. And so I started to tinker with it when I was 10. I'm 55 this fall. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, that's a long time ago, and I stuck with it. And, uh, you know, for a long time, thought I was only one of a handful of flint workers out there. And then I met Eric, and... Uh, I, at that point, was I was just starting college in Central Michigan and at Alma College, and then I met Mike Cook, who's uh, you know Flint Napper, a summer now, who lives only about forty minutes from me. Uh-huh. Started to hang out with Mike, and he he was going out to Callahan's classes, and it just kind of snowballed. Oh, that's interesting. So I, I just I decided I wanted to do a degree in archaeology. Uh, so I did one at Alma College and, you know, flint napping all the while and, you know, my ability to understand the lithics we found, uh, you know, Central Michigan is not spectacular, uh, but there's a lot of large collections. It was a very helpful component. And then I, uh, graduated in 87 and ended up at the University of Wyoming oh. with George, George Frizen, oh, uh, doing paleo, paleo Indian stuff and still flint napping and, uh, you know, that was really the the window when I got interested in uh, the more modern flint napping world. I learned, about, you know, at that time, Fort Osage was uh, really a big deal. And Don Kyleberg, uh, J.B. Salberger was still alive down in Texas. And I'd go down to Don's uh, gatherings at his home uh, near Colleen and uh, did that all from Wyoming. I saw met Bruce Bradley for the first time in Cheyenne, Wyoming, when Bruce came up to do a demonstration. And, you know, my I wrote a dissertation on a, paleo, or a master's thesis on a Paleo-Indian site at, at Sunrise, Wyoming, that was all busted up uh, Paleo points of different varieties. And, you know, I needed a way to put myself through graduate school, so I started making custom knives with stone blades at a little company called the prehistoric edge and i joined the knife makers guild and i made my living and paid my apartment and tuition by selling stone knives back uh back in the late 80s and uh you know there weren't a lot of there's a ton of not ton of steel knife collectors who were into the custom market but no one at that time was making stone blades uh and i was and uh you know i fell over when I realized, you know, one year in about 1989, I think I made twenty or $22,000 just on, just on making knives. Wow. And it, you know, paid my, paid my living and it was a great, uh, great life and drove out to Glass Buttes to collect uh, rock and still remember stacking a thousand pounds of obsidian on my balcony of the little apartment I had, you yelled at by the by the uh, landlord because uh-huh. it was blowing my deck out all the weight from, oh, from the rock. I rented a little studio in a, uh, in a closed 
school in Laramie to Flint Napier around. Oh, that's so neat. those were those were good years, and I graduated from Wyoming with a, with an MA and ended up at the University of Wisconsin to do a PhD, and I wanted to do lithics, and um, thought I was going to work in India with a professor, and I ended up having an opportunity to go to Denmark with the department chair, Doug Price. So I went for the first time in uh, 92, and, uh, you know, that that was really an eye-opener. Uh I ended up living on and off in Denmark for a number of years and met all the Danish Glennappers, Torbjörn Peterson and Bo Madsen and Peter Vemming. Uh, you know, there aren't a lot of them, but they were they were all quite accomplished doing European stuff and blades and square axes and daggers. And, um, you know, it kind of was a snap back to that window at Cliffside with Eric. You know, I got to see kind of what got him all cranked up and, I ended up as a Fulbright uh, scholar at, uh, based uh, at the Danish National Museum, so I got to had free reign of the dagger collections at the National Museum back in the mid '90s, uh-huh. and that really got me really got me interested. And um, anyway, moved back to the states, finished my dissertation, and uh, graduated in '95. And I started at Cranbrook at, uh, as the archaeology curator for the museum there in, in February '96, and never really quit flint napping. I, uh, you know, made most of the napins, Flint Ridge, Letchworth, Osage back when it still was there. Um, ended up writing a dissertation on uh, the flint technology of early agriculture, the transition to agriculture in Scandinavia, that ended up getting published by. Uh, Oh, Aarhus University Press, um, you know, kind of cooled it on the, on the night business just because I got so busy. We, my wife, I got, was married by then and we were starting to have children. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I, I dropped out of napping pretty much for about eight years. I uh, just, I taught it a little at the museum, but, you know, I was starting to make daggers and I felt like I'd accomplished everything I wanted to and. Uh, I picked it up again kind of hard about four years ago, uh-huh. and um, I've been napping pretty steadily at least from about, oh, I don't know, May through the end of October every year, and all day, uh, at this point, my interest is solely uh, the European stuff, right? Uh, primarily uh, type fours and type ones and uh, square section technology, Um published a couple articles uh, in one uh, in antiquity on uh, the production sequences of type fours and then another in uh, Journal of Archaeological Science on the production of type ones and I've written a few things with John Whitaker through the years. Uh-huh. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm interested, I'm still interested in them academically as a pursuit and I get a lot of relaxation and pleasure my skills have really come along uh, particularly over the last oh four or five years uh sorting out the reduction sequences of, of the type four stuff um you know i work uh i worked in danish flint i work uh, i love uh, the georgetown that james abood is pouring out of uh, his private quarry in texas near austin uh-huh. uh, it comes in huge pieces and it's a so consistent it's just perfect for for dagger stuff it doesn't need any heat treatment the reduction is pretty straightforward but i make uh you know i'm probably this is uh this is as productive as i've been this season and last season i make about oh 12 or 15 pieces a year uh-huh. uh i keep most of them i gift a few here and there i sell a couple uh everything signed i'm i don't really sell pieces done in Danish Flint because I don't want them ever um, passed off. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm interested in it from the technology perspective. I mean, Mike Cook really pursues the wildest, most colorful patterned rock he can find, and right. I'm just simply interested in the best materials that are appropriate for, for Danish work. So mm-hmm. I work mostly, I work Danish, Georgetown, and Keokuk. From uh, Craig Ratzatz, a friend, he came over to the um, to Denmark with me 
uh, once, and I showed him around. Actually, I owe D.C. Waldorf a huge, uh, he's probably the biggest influence on anything I've done and learned. Uh-huh. You know, I met D.C. Uh, way back in the Fort Osage days, and, uh, you know, he showed me, at that point, he let me sit and watch him and answer any question I had from start to finish on Stitch Dagger stuff. Um, and then his wife, uh, Valerie, uh, D.C. and Val came and lived with us in Denmark in 94, and Valerie did the drawings for my dissertation, and Dave came along, and we spent two weeks together just flint napping and collecting stone. And I took him to the National Museum and got him in the collections, and, uh, you know, I, I have such huge respect for him because until that time, Dave had never been to Scandinavia. You know, he learned, he figured out all of his tricks based on the few originals he had access to here in the States and then casts and pictures. Right. Uh, so, you know, of all of the people I know, I mean, the guy that I think is the most innovative uh, and the most generous willing to share anything he knew was Dave Waldorf. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I owe Dave an enormous credit. I always try to give that between him and, you know, Callahan exposed me to it, but Waldorf really really immersed me in it and then uh i just kind of ran from there as a grad student uh uh, but i owe those guys enormous credit for sure and and uh jim spears did you ever you must have worked with jim spears i met jim i met jim a number of times and he was always incredibly generous uh with his time and and particularly you know helping me advance uh with with my basic and, you know, like Spears, I'm pretty much an abo napper. I'm not, I don't use copper batons. Uh, I don't have anything. Hello? Antler batons, antler punches, uh, copper and bronze pressure flakers, which uh, were used in prehistory. Um, but I was very inspired watching Spears work. Um, and I also admired uh, Peter Kelterborn. I don't know if you ever met Peter Ray. Oh, uh, no, uh, I didn't. He, he, Peter was a Swiss engineer. He passed away a few years ago uh, who unlocked kind of the uh, Egyptian Grisean knife uh, knife production. And Peter traveled in Europe and looked at originals in European museums, including the British Museum. He was an engineer by training and just had real masterful abilities with problem solving. And he was part of the crew running around the Lyra Research Center when Bo Madsen was there, and Eric was there, and Jacques Pellegrin was there. Uh, but I visited Peter. He hosted uh, my wife and I at his home outside uh, Zurich years ago. And uh, Jacques Pellegrin came for dinner that night. I still remember it. Oh, wow. Uh, Peter gifted me one of his early uh, Grisean, uh practice proofs that he had done at Danish Flint. And uh, Pellegrin gave me a beautiful little laurel leaf point and showed us some late technology. Uh, but, you know, I was always struck with how generous all those, the guys you think of that are really accomplished, that you only read about when you meet these guys personally, how incredibly generous they were with their time and willingness to uh, share everything they knew. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, Peter was an extraordinary example, just like Waldorf. And, uh, you know, every one of them that I ever met was willing to, to, to show me what they were up to. So, and I try to, you know, that's kind of my philosophy. I try to do the same. I don't really do anything I'm not willing to show anybody. Uh-huh. Now, but, like, uh, uh, have you ever, do you have any contact with some of the modern, uh, like Ed Mosier is a dagger maker now? And... Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I know Ed. I, uh, we talk from time to time and uh, saw him at Flint Ridge uh, last year, I guess. Uh, and I'm, I'm, Acquainted at least with most of the most of the modern uh, flint workers. Uh, yeah, the Facebook uh, flint napping group is is really something as far as uh, looking at what other people are doing. I'm very inspired by. I've uh, uh, never met him personally, but a guy named Larry Ware, W A R E, right, who makes makes these big fantasy uh, blades that are, you know. Uh, grinds them and then he's flaking the edges into just wild fantasy forms yeah i've seen that Uh, that's pretty amazing you know he's not trying to emulate anything he's Uh -uh. just picking it it up for sheer uh 
your art's sake and seeing how far you can push it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I, a, I'm aware I, that's I, pretty I find, neat. I, I find that fascinating, and uh, the stuff he's doing absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very taken with you know I I'm you know I follow with some interest some of these conversations about you know should guys be working off of slabs and is working with copper boppers real napping and it, you know frankly it makes absolutely no difference to me it just really depends on what your end goals are if you're doing archaeological napping trying to reproduce sequences done in the past I mean of course you need to use the tools that were only available to the Stone Age folks right but you know now with flint napping morphing more into an art form I mean I all you know whatever people do and however they choose to do it is just fine by me right. even making your uh, own your own lithic material I see guys making like ghost figures uh, in between glass and fusing it and all this other stuff it's it's just fascinating what people are doing. Oh, I agree. I mean, it's a whole new world out there when you look and see, particularly some of the younger guys. Uh, I mean, how far they're carrying the art form. Right. So I'm. Uh, I, mean, I really appreciate that kind of work. I'm still I'm, I'm still deeply interested in folks who are doing, uh, you know, true replication kind of work. Greg Nunn. You know, the stuff Greg did on Type 1s, I mean, all of his blades are ground by hand, and, you know, he's using a, he's using a late Neolithic toolkit to do it, and, I mean, that stuff really cranks me up, and, and that's what I'm trying to do with the Type 4 stuff I work on. Right. Uh, but, uh, but I like it all. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I, I, I so appreciate the folks that are really extending the art form. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny because when, uh, I think it was like 1969, I was, I would have been nine years old, and uh, I was at the beach with my parents, and we were hiking through the sand dunes, me and my brother, and we there was a shell mound, and it was like, there was chunks of chert and all this other stuff in there, and bone, you know, bone awls and everything, and what happened is the sand dune had blown and moved and exposed this huge archaeological site, so... You know, we were walking through it, and we found a couple arrowheads, and back then, there was no real antiquities, laws, or anything like this. So anyway, we picked up some of the arrowheads, and then a couple years ago, we were looking through them, and, and one of them was flake over grinding. Uh, I mean, it looked like flake over grinding, but it was like a porous green obsidian that uh, looked like maybe from Mexico or something with... You know, perfectly, perfectly diagonal flaking everything. It snapped off the top and the bottom. But when I look at it now, I could swear that that's modern lapidary napping. And I found it in 1969, which, I mean, besides Richard Warren, which was much later, I don't know who would be doing something like that. Yeah, I don't either. I have no idea. But it looked to me like it would, it had been, some guy had done flake over grinding and just, and broke it and as a joke tossed it on this archaeological pile. Or it was something that, you know, has traded in from Mexico and was actually old. You know, I don't know, but it's kind of a weird thing. You know, I'm really interested, uh, it's, you know, you talk about the history of flint napping. I'm very interested still in, uh, we have a big collection of uh, this type of work in our fakes area at Cranbrook, uh, you know, Marvin McCormick and Reinhardt, you know, the old great coat right. makers, um, you know, and Eric told me years and years and years ago that he actually had tracked down either McCormick or Reinhardt or both of their, uh, their trailers in Texas and their debutage piles and, you know, these guys are cranking out gray ghosts off of big fat slabs with some kind of lever devices. I, I find all that fascinating. I, it makes me smile every time I see a big gray ghost point. Yeah, I love those brought things. Into, <laughs> brought into the museum. You know, I mean, the sections are totally flat. They're not convex. From the, they're not grinding them. They're just taking flat slabs and jacking big, gigantic uh, pressure flakes, uh, again, with a lever device of some kind across the faces. Yeah, one guy said to Reinhardt, he says, these don't look like real points. And he says, they're not, they're Reinhardt points. <laughs> so he was okay with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it's, hey, it's part of the history of modern flint working. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's all super interesting stuff. 
What yeah. else, Ray? Well, what else? What else is? What else do you want to talk about? Well, I had a list of stuff, but you pretty much hit on all of it. The uh, Waldorf and the stitching, and you know, these are the notes I took from the from uh, John Whitaker's books. Uh, but you pretty much covered everything. Uh, the only thing is, is like when I play it back and I write it down, I may have some more questions. Um, okay, sure. But, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of other stuff, but, uh, you know, at this age, I can only hold so much information on my endocranial recorder. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just fun to, you know, it's fun to talk to you because, it, you know, you've got the deep time perspective on kind of how napping has evolved. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, because I remember, I, I remember all those guys and, uh, you know, I got to meet a lot of them and it was just, a, it was probably the most, when I met Callahan in, in, in Waldorf, I mean, I thought I died and went to heaven. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, I, 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 wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to be those guys because uh, uh -huh. Callahan in particular, you know, he had all, he knew all the famous Europeans. I mean, he met Francois Bord and, uh -huh. Again, knew Jacques Pellegrin and had worked with him in workshops at Lyra and Kelterborn. And, I mean, that really opened my eyes to the fact that there's this kind of global community out there of, of guys that are doing mostly archaeological sorts of pursuits, but doing it through flint napping. Yeah. And modern replication work. And, you know, then Callahan picking it up with his knives and picking it up where the Stone Age, I think Aaron always viewed it as picking it up where the Stone Age folks left and, right. you know, carrying it that next, that next mile forward sort of thing. Well, what are your thoughts on, uh, like, Theodore Orcutt? I'm sorry, you broke up there a little, Ray. Uh, on, on, well, on who? well, what are your thoughts on Theodore Orcutt, the Karak master uh, big b dance blade maker? Do you, do you Have you ever researched him at all? No, I haven't. I, I haven't done that, but uh, probably ought to. Well, I'm I'm just I've had I mean I guess it's it's lucky for me, but uh, just recently I've been contacted by a lot of younger people that are into lithic technology and archaeology, just asking me different things, which is kind of fun. Because uh, I remember when I was in college, I was seeking out uh, Don Crabtree. Solberg or uh -huh. uh, Callahan, and they were like my superheroes, like my Star Wars characters of, of when I was a kid. Cause I, yeah. I can remember in, uh, it, I, I remember I wrote a letter to Don Crabtree, and uh, you know, I don't know what transpired. I think he was really sick at the time, but I never got a letter back. But I did get letters back from J.B. Solberger and Eric Callahan and stuff, and, and even Dave Waldorf. And to me, it was like, Every day I'd go out to the mailbox, and if I got something, it was pure elation. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and it was yeah. like back I then, it was, they just wanted to share back then. And then later, it seemed to me later, people got a little tighter. Uh, maybe not with so much information, but, you know, when the, when the nap-ins, when I first started going to nap-ins, actually there wasn't any out where I was, so I had to invent my own. But uh, at first it was just like information sharing information, and then all of a sudden one day there was a, a booth at one of the nap ends. And then the next year it was all booths. And then from a circle of nappers, you know, disgusting lithic technology type items, it was all like trying to sell stuff. And for me it kind of was like a, it was kind of a letdown. But I'm sure those other ones still go on. It's just that, you know, with raising kids and I had a, a career and, I have like a million other hobbies too, so I didn't really get yeah. a chance to like like people like you know people like you and and things that fully engulf themselves. I just really love reading about you guys and stuff. But see, I just never had the the time. I mean, I guess I could have made the time, but like my dad was like he liked to do woodwork and hunting, and my brother and my other family members and stuff. So I just kind of like yeah. as much as I could, I would soak it up. But I never really, yep. you know, I never really, I mean, I, I was, a, I loved hobby napping and I still do it. But to the people who live the lithics, like Bruce Bradley was my hero, George Frizzum, uh, you know, the yeah. guys that did the Odyssey program and Nova. To me, that was like, like other people were, you know, into the rock and roll music. I was into the rocks without the music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, was, I was the same. I mean, I, I remember 
Ray, back uh, right when I, probably 1990, I learned about, uh, you know, I knew of Crabtree from Callahan's, and because uh, Eric had, had a couple, uh, I think they were eccentrics that Crabtree had done. Uh-huh. And it was getting back in the window when Crabtree was doing prismatic pressure blades and things. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I learned that Crabtree had published this whole series of articles and that you could buy them out of, uh, you know, Idaho, uh, Pocatello. Right. And I remember I ordered all the, every single, every single thing that Don Crabtree had ever published that was for sale. Uh-huh. I ordered, and I, I bet I read those damn things a dozen times each. Yeah, I, I wore out my first set, and then I bought it on on digital. But uh, yeah, I was I did the same thing. But I'm I'm really dyslexic, so like I would try to start writing something or I do experiments. But you know, my dyslexic was so bad that people thought I was you know like a special needs or something. And I really, besides my professor at college, which was a, a, a lithic technologist that studied under boards, his name was Clay Singer. And we would we would do projects together, but when he was fired from the university for marijuana, uh, and when that happened, it just like I pretty much lost contact with with anyone that was willing to work with me because I just that I don't know. It's it's just like people wanted like the specific you know systematic perfection that I couldn't deliver, you know. But uh, I yeah. still appreciate reading other people's stuff. You know, it's like I love it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. I eat it up. It's uh, I just yeah, I try to read everything I can get my hands on for sure. So what about uh, other? The only thing I can think of besides that, I mean, I know a lot of people. Not a lot of people, but some people endeavoring in the uh, the Danish daggers and Woody Blackwell, who uh, I was talking to Ed Moser, and he said Woody Blackwell came to him to to learn his uh, his handles and his stitching. Have you yeah. seen uh, Woody Blackwell's uh, daggers? I have. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, you know Woody is just—I mean, the guy is so naturally talented uh. in anything. I mean, there's there's not enough weeks in Woody's remaining life to tackle all of the world. I mean, he could take on any. I'm convinced of all the flint nappers out there. I mean, you know, I don't care if it's pressure blades, eccentrics, Grzan. Daggers, whatever you know, Woody, Woody can unscramble all of it. Yeah, because the guy is such a phenomenal artist. Well, I've never met uh, him, but I have. You know, I read what he does, and and uh, of course, I read Woody's Dream that like puts his analytical perspective is 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 really. He's got a clear idea of what what the basic item is. Like if it's Clovis or Danish, he has an ability to focus in on what is you know what the what what the what the whole perspective of that artifact is before he starts and then yeah. you know he re, he yeah. reverse engineers it it's like really ingenious how he does those things yeah no it really it really is and you know then he knocks out four or five perfect examples and he moves on to something else yeah and uh you know i think i think that's pretty cool i was looking at a couple images last night of some of his recent stuff and uh no it's darn good yeah yeah i don't think i don't think any of us have gotten that spot on yet i think you know some of us are producing stuff um you know that's within the the realm of variation that that you see archaeologically with the dagger forms but uh you know for the best of the best of the best i don't i don't think any of us have hit it on yet you know, i think i think the, the world the world the work that uh ed morland's doing is really is really quite fantastic yeah yeah, and he's a self-taught guy. Uh, you know, just he saw the saw the north of, some of the, the the examples in North American collections and just kind of figured it out. Yeah, he told me that and, he figured you know, out he was he was worried about it and thinking about it and, and sweating over it. And he says one night he had a dream and it told him exactly how to do it and it and it worked. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever the impetus is. Uh, you know, it's interesting, he's, uh, I'm always fascinated, you know, guys like him and Waldorf that sorted it out just from seeing a handful of examples, but, it, you know, I learned, a, and a lot of the Danes did the same that I that I know, you know, because their napping tradition is so entrenched in doing square stuff, I mean, kind of the first thing you learn to do over there is blades and square axes. And, you know, those two, those two elements are so critical to successful dagger production 
and you know there's there's almost no by facing in the Danish tradition until the dagger period. Uh-huh. And so, you know, to this day, I mean, the hobby, the hobbyist Danish nappers I know spend most of their time working square and making really awesome blades. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, guys like Moreland, you know, they're coming from the exact opposite tradition in D.C. You know, he was doing Hopewell stuff. You know, he was making Snyder's points, and he had the, the by-facing down pat, but then kind of had to backtrack to learn the techniques associated with doing square stuff and working with a punch. Right. And, you know, to their credit, both of them have <clears throat> figured out their own holding positions. You know, uh, Waldorf uses a vice. Moreland does it between his knees like I do. Is that, is, that, the is that Moreland or Mosier? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Mosier. Oh, because I've read I've read stuff from both I've read most both of those guys, so I I guess good. Yeah, no, it's Ed, it's Ed Mosier that I've been referring to. Because right, I I do Mosier. know both those guys that I've talked to before. But, so uh, do you think yeah, there was like a cottage industry kind of like the gunflint uh, makers, where there's you know one master and then other people you know working in there? How do you think those daggers? Do you think it was like a cottage industry or an individual like Master Napper doing those things? Well, I, that's a, I think that's a great question, and there's tons of uh, stuff being written about that. You know, the whole idea about craft specialization uh, showing up in the in the latter part of the Neolithic. There's an American who uh, named Debbie Olison, who is a teacher, a professor at the University of London, Sweden. Uh, Debbie's lived there, got, I don't know, 30 years, and is married to a Swede. You know, that's her whole deal is uh, trying to sort out the networks for production and what does it look like? You know, is it a, is a one guy? Is it a kind of a little cast of uber primo dagger makers? Uh, I'm not sure she's completely sorted it out yet, but I mean, what I can tell you is that if you look at, I mean, what you see on the internet are the images of the best of the best. You know, that's or that's what gets shown. For every one beautiful hinsgal ish dagger, I mean, there's there's hundreds of stubby, crude, you know, less accomplished examples. So, you know, I think that by the time bronze daggers are being inspirational templates being traded into Denmark and everybody wants one that looks like it, there's, you know, just like, just like modern watchmaking, you know, you can, there's, basic utilitarian stuff that everybody has and then there's real high status stuff that's being made by a handful of really gifted flint workers that you know every now and then you see you know you see a henskow like dagger or at least a handle that is every bit as tight and you know that's clearly beyond the abilities of most utilitarian flint workers right um but you know whether it's organized in a cash system or a mentor system or a, a la guild system, you know, or a family, you know, I think it's anyone's guess. Um, I think clearly there's a hard, there's a group of a handful of incredibly accomplished craftspeople, men or women, who have mastered the art and are creating the best of the best in terms of status objects that are going to the highest status individuals. But you know, whether the production is one person doing it start to finish or if it's a small group where they take turns doing stages, you know, at this point it's anyone's guess because, you know, there aren't, uh, you know, there, to my knowledge still, there aren't designated places where, like, workshops for just nothing but dagger producers. I mean, they're right. scattered, on the, scattered around on the landscape. Denmark is a... Uh, you know, an incredible erosional zone where sites get mixed and blended. And they're, if they're doing it, the grinding stages by the coast, you know, those sites get demolished. And, you know, maybe some year someone will find a big lithic production area from the latter Neolithic that'll be clear, clearly dagger production where you can start to sort out some of those questions. But it's still an open issue. Uh-huh. I think it's, I think it's, you know, I think it's a, a, probably a lot like today right. where you get people that are that are specialists in one area mm-hmm. and they can create virtuoso works that people aspire to but most of them are you know they are they're doing work that is far under what that person is able to do 
Right. Um, and then, you know, once the, once the Stone Age comes to a full close, you know, it never emerges again as, as, you, as time goes on through the Bronze Age and Iron Age and, and so on. So it just kind of falls into history. Right. So uh, not to change the subject too much, but I will. <laughs> What do, what do you think about this? What do you what do you what do you think about the Sweetwater biface and that and that super thin biface technology? Oh, phenomenal! You know, again, virtuoso, some dapper that was a virtuoso bifacer that you know just was able to do work head and shoulders above what any of his or her contemporaries were able to do. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of outliers in. I mean, look at some of the you know, there's a handful of my original Mayan eccentrics that are out there that are head and shoulders above what you see in, on the other Mayan sites. I mean, yeah. there's there's Aya knives from from Egypt that are you know clearly masterworks. Uh, you know, for every one of those, there's dozens of ones that are much more sloppy. Uh-huh. You know, it's, it's the Woody Blackwell syndrome. I mean, you, right. these people emerge in a generation, and they're just gifted craftspeople who are. You know, able to absolutely push the boundaries and serve as inspiration for others, but you know, a lot of uh, those that uh, that aspire to it just aren't ever able to produce similar products. And Sweetwater's probably one. Right. Wenatchee, so, Wenatchee's another. You right. know. Uh-huh. I mean, the massive Wenatchee points, the pen cash stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I got to, I got to handle all of that stuff when I was a grad student. George Frizen had it in his office one afternoon, and called called me in and let me fondle all of the Fen cash. <laughs> and, I mean, it's just mind-blowing, mind-blowing stuff done by a virtuoso. Right. But very, you know, but, but those kinds of nappers are outliers, and they're just incredibly gifted craftspeople that, uh, you know, had the skills and had the rock and had the, the right day to produce those incredible, incredible remnants of their craft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Well, what I what I'll do is I guess I'll just keep, if you don't mind, maybe like in a couple months uh, after I get everything like in, uh, you know, send you everything, and then I'll probably have a whole plethora of new questions if you don't mind. Sure. And then. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. No, I'm I'm happy to help any way I can, right? I I really enjoy talking to you. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, it's really great. So, and and not. No, shoot me a, there's not a whole lot of people. That, Go ahead. Take note of this. Uh, this is my cell phone, which you can reach me on at any time. Okay. So uh, stick it in your phone, and uh, yeah, give me a buzz any time, man. I'd, uh, I'd really like to talk to you more. Okay, that's great. Well, I've always like had it on my bucket list to uh, get into the da- dagger stuff, but then I always get sidetracked uh-huh. by, by something else. <laughs> Yeah. But I can always appreciate other people, you know, and that's and the stages, you know, it's just like, um, you know, the ca- crab tree law where, you know, you, can, you look at the fine, the, the, the more refined, the less, you know, but you guys have been able yeah. to figure it out. Even with the most refined artifacts, people are figuring it out. And that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the one that. The one thing on my bucket list still is, uh, you know, I don't really, I appreciate fluting. I'm not, I'm not drawn to it to spend a lot of time at it, but uh, I'm very fascinated with uh, prismatic uh, pressure blades. Oh yeah, Big me ones. too. And uh, that's, uh, that's the, my next interest. So maybe this winter I'm going to start tinkering uh, indoors with, uh, uh, you know, make myself a chest crutch and, uh, I've read everything there is to see and watched all the videos I can find about how to how they're done, and I bet I could get good at those. Yeah, and I'd like to. That's the next thing I want to play with. Well, it sounds like anything you put your mind to, you're you're getting done well. So, well, I have no doubt. It takes time, but I'm I, that that's got my interest for a next project. So, but I don't. I'll never give up the Danish stuff. I'm I'm just too married to that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, because I love your writing and. And your artifact, your neo facts and everything. It's uh, just love that stuff, you know. I just uh, yeah. Oh, you bet. And I appreciate you, you uh, taking your time to talk to me. It's kind of funny because yeah, I, I was talking to one of the newer flint nappers, Jimmy Williams, who who's doing the for like over grinding and some Ishi stuff, and uh-huh. you know he's really a fascinating guy, and he's he really 
you know, he's, you know, uh, trying to replicate things that like Jim Hopper, Richard Warren right now. And, and we talk and it's just fascinating how, you know, we've gone from replicating artifacts from ancient peoples or proto-historic peoples to now people are replicating modern Napper stuff. And it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really cool observation. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Pretty soon, people will start trying to make gray ghosts with the same flake scars as McCormick and Reinhardt. Yeah, that I actually did go through that stage. I uh, <laughs> I tried to replicate his uh, his his, and other people have too, but replicate his uh, jig and then replicating his flake scars and his edging and I you know I there there's a you know he went through a, a change too where. You can tell his early points from his later points, and you know there's uh, his different techniques and staging, and what what his stuff looked like after he met Crab, uh, Callahan, and Solberg. It changed a little bit, and it's kind of interesting. Yep. But yeah, uh, no, I agree. But I like I his I like his early stuff the best because that's pure Reinhardt, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, I do too. Yeah, if it's if it looks like a table, if it looks like a table bench, and there's like grand marks in, to get this, the stuff you missed in the middle, that's like his classic stuff. So that's what I like the best, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nah, me too, me too, Ray. So that's well, interesting. Well, listen, man, have a have a have a great week, and don't hesitate to give a call, okay? I appreciate it, and when it gets lo- when it gets farther along, and luckily I have some people working with me that are you know, really high into the technical part of editing. So it should come out pretty good at the other end. Okay. Well, I look for, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, I'll definitely get you a copy and, uh, I appreciate it. Okay, man. And I'll let you go on your drive. Have a, have a great week. Yeah, you too. Thanks again. Okay. Right. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye.